project called Words for Water. Really simple project. I just posed the question, if you could speak for water, what would you say? They write that word on a chalkboard. I take that word, those chalkboard pictures and I string them together into a, a collective story. And why the collective piece is so very, very important is that, like it or not, our communities are diverse. There are folks that think, you know, 2,500, 3,500, 4,500 head of dairy cows is okay, and there are folks that think organic's the only way to go. But if you're living in the same community, guess what, you gotta deal with it. <coughs> so what do you do when you find yourself in a situation where you think, man, common ground's gonna get to be pretty damn tricky to figure out where it is? You keep going up, 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 until you can see the forest for the trees, so to speak. And so we, when we came up with this project, we figured water was the common ground. Everyone, I, I don't believe that anyone in their heart wants to have a world full of polluted water, because ultimately it's gonna screw, it's gonna screw everything up, because we need that water as well. And so we started this project as a way to start telling our collective story about water, which these, are, these words are value words. And in a, in a well-functioning democracy, our legislation is based on these value words. And how the, that legislation is crafted based on our values is who we put into office. And so the Words for Water Project helped me think about, well, how do we talk about that stuff? How do I, how do we do that? And we came up with three questions that every community needs to ask yourselves. And I encourage you to ask yourself these questions before you start diving deep into NR 243 or the NRCS rules or ordinances, because that stuff's really fun to talk about, but if you don't have common ground, if you don't have a place to start from, nothing's going to happen that's going to stick. And so the three questions are, who are you in your community? What do you value? And how do you protect what you value? You only can answer number three, which is the NR, the NR rules, NRCS rules, ordinances. You can only answer that question in a way that is reflective of everyone in your community after you've answered, who are we and what do we value? And everyone needs to be able to contribute their answers to that. I think that that is key to noodling our way through these problems. I jokingly say that if you're in a conversation where you're not a little sweaty and a little nervous, you're probably in a conversation that's not gonna make much change. Because if you're talking, if you're in an echo chamber, of course you're the smartest person in the room, but is that what's gonna help your community and the, the people coming after us? And so I, um, there's an author that I really, really like named Terry Tempest Williams. And I always read this um, piece of hers. It's actually in the intro of my cookbook because I love it so much. I think it really kind of captures what we're going to talk about here tonight because you're going to have some things that might make you a little irritated or might make you feel a little you know feisty remember this what terry has to say she says it just may be that the most radical act we can commit is to stay home what does that mean to finally commit to a place to a people to a community it doesn't mean it's easy but it does mean you can live with patience because you're not going to go away it also means commitment to bear witness in engaging in casserole diplomacy by sharing food among neighbors, by playing with the children, mending feuds, and caring for the sick. These kind of commitments are real. They are tangible. They are not esoteric or idealistic, but rooted in the bedrock existence of where we choose to maintain our lives. That way, we begin to know the predictability of a place. We anticipate a species long before we see them. We can chart the changes because we have a memory of cycles and seasons. We gain a capacity for both pleasure and pain, and we find the strength within ourselves and each other to hold these lines. That's my definition of family, and that's my definition of love. So we think about what Terry says and how she frames it. I think she frames it really well, which is we're committed to home, and we're not going to go away. And we also know that the farmers in our community and the folks that want to grow bigger, guess what? They're not going to go away either. This isn't a zero-sum game. There shouldn't be an all-out loser and an all-out winner. 
because that does not create change that lasts. That creates reactionary change, and you know the next time the change in the guard, the is gonna swing right towards the other direction. And I think another thing that, because um, we, when at Bayfield, when I got in charge of the CAFO gate, I had a couple of things going against me. One, I'm not a farmer. Two, I was from Minneapolis. And I was a, you know, a newcomer to Bayfield, and what the hell was I doing telling farmers what to do? It was a big, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I got a lot of pushback on that. And so it made me think, it kind of got me into this mindset about, you're right, like what does it mean to be at home? What does that struggle, that uncomfortableness I felt when I was in conversations with folks and feeling like they were mad or I was getting all feisty? And I realized that perhaps what if we viewed that the struggle, those spaces of tension, as that's the place where change happens. Don't run away from those feelings where you're like, oh God, I don't know where this is going to go. Instead of continuing, when you feel that, instead of continuing to talk at them, take a step back and say, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Tell me more is the best thing to say in situations where you feel like you are pretty committed to your position. Because you already know your position. You want to learn what the other folks' positions are so you can help you formulate yours. Perhaps it might strengthen your position. I'm not saying that we need, you know, you got to, there's some things that are just true. And there's some things that can be created with a lot of different input from different people in the community. Another thing I wanted to talk about today a little bit is um, this whole idea of community and looking at it. Since I am, I, I'm a big believer in water. So I was thinking one day, how does this, how does organizing work? How do we get a community to figure out how to work together? Because to be frank with you, we're not very good at that in this society, for whatever reason. And I thought, what if we looked at community and organizing like a watershed? Probably gonna hear some talking about tonight about a watershed. And the important part as a community member is to, if we're gonna think like a watershed, then our only job is to define that common ground. To find these value words that live in your community and allow everyone else in your community to move through the landscape of your home, their home. If you figured out that you know that they're moving towards common ground, you've spent time defining, it does not matter how they do it. We don't get to tell people what to do. We get to talk to people and figure out who they are what do they value and what can we all can do together to protect that? And it's something that I've noticed a lot in the, and I'm new to the self advocacy world, and it seems like there's a lot of moral high horsing that happens. And um, I always tell people, when you're on your moral high horse, you're the, you're the tallest thing on the horizon, and you're the easiest to pick off. So you better get off your horse, get back down with the people where it's safe, because this is where this, is where this happens, is when we're all together. And I know it's, it's hard to take what I'm saying and put it in the context of very real threats to your water, to our health, to our air, to our property values. This is real, real stuff, right? And sometimes this more high level stuff feels a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs on, on the Titanic. But I wonder if that's where the change happens. The change doesn't happen when we're yelling at each other about how right we are. The change happens when we're saying, tell me more who are you? What do you value? Tell me about that. We're figuring all that information out first. And um, finally, I'm going to wrap it up with this other great quote that I love that says, um, because it's big, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. This is, I, mean, I go into people's homes all over the state, and I can't, it makes me sad when I walk into someone's house and they have cheese and crackers and coffee and juice, and they want to know how to stop a capo. And I have to tell them, you know what? Chances are pretty good you're not going to because they don't often get stopped. Regulatory certainty that was provided to the industry with the passage of ATCAP 51, we can't say no to a community. It literally is a who's next question because it could be any community in the state. And so that's big, big stuff. And what I encourage you to do is absolutely engaged, learn the rules of the road. But as part of that third question, how do we protect what we value? That's where you all can come in and join your county boards. 
get on your committee. You don't have to be elected to be on a committee of a land conservation um, committee. They have citizen members. Get on your zoning committee. Run for county board. We have, we have uh, elections coming up in April. You can take your papers out on December 1st, I think, and they're due January 3rd. I mean, we have to start thinking instead of, we have to absolutely engage with the DNR as much as we can, but it's important to remember that the DNR is funded and directed by the people we put in office. Our target should not be the DNR. Our target should be the people we elected. And they are elected, not anointed. They don't have to be there. But in order for them not to be there, someone's got to run against them. Someone has to do that work in the community to get enough consensus where people want to, they trust you enough to put you in that office. And it's a long game and it's not easy. I'm not going to lie, but it's something that needs to be done. And to do that work, we have to start with defining common ground. Who are we? What do we value? How do we protect what we value? And this guy, there's actually a job in the world called Social Change Innovator. And his name's Rick Young. He's from up in Canada. And he says that, he says, my point is that to give up hope is not just to deny the possibilities of the future. It is also to deny the lessons of the past. The world can change and does change. And what seemed almost impossible looking forward can seem almost inevitable looking back. And so, it's big stuff, but you used to be able to smoke in hospitals, and you can't anymore. <laughs> and when they started talking about smoking in hospitals, they were like, that's a great idea, let's ban it now. Tobacco was a big, they were, they had a lot of dough, they had a lot of influence, and you can't smoke in hospitals anymore. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary. She's been a real inspiration to people all across the state. She travels everywhere, so I really appreciate her taking time to come here tonight and talk to us about her mission. Next up, we have Neil Cook. I first met Neil over in Dunn County when Dunn County was going through uh, their livestock water, groundwater committee and listen to him speak to some of the Dunn County board and he's so plain spoken and easy to understand groundwater can get very technical very fast and it just kind of glaze everybody over it. but Neil does a great job of explaining it and I wanted him to come he wasn't able to come to our groundwater committee meetings over the past nine months so I wanted him to come tonight and give his song and dance and <laughs> go ahead thank you I'm a retired hydrologist, geologist from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, working in Washington, D.C., South Carolina, and South Dakota, and I did some private consulting with a Superfund study in Cheyenne and, and down at the nuclear study in Nevada, and uh, moved to Menominee and retired uh, some 27 years ago, and have been involved in uh, learning about the groundwater in the Chippewa Valley and giving talks and uh, PowerPoint talks and things to everybody I could about what is groundwater. It's hidden, so we have all kinds of ideas of what's happening. An aquifer, we've heard of the word aquifer, it's any sediment or rock where you can put a well down and t obtain water. There's only one aquifer in the Chippewa Valley, Pierce, St. Croix, the whole area, Barron, one aquifer. And keep in mind, you'll, you'll maybe come across people who say, no, there's more than one aquifer. Uh, the 25 years I've been in Dunn County, I still run across people saying there's two. I said, no, there's only one. Now, industrial people that want to come in to your area and uh, put down maybe a, a, an industry that could contaminate aquifer, they would like to say there's more than one aquifer. There isn't. There's only one. Now that aquifer is under water table conditions, which means anything placed on top of the ground will move down to the aquifer. So any contaminant. Now where does the water come from in our aquifer? It comes from rain and snow melt right in your county, St. Croix, Pierce, Dunn, and so forth. So it doesn't come from any place else but right here. And where does the water go from the aquifer? It goes to the nearby streams and lakes and leaves. So we have uh, the cycle. We don't get any water from Lake Superior or the St. Croix River. It's all discharging into those sources. Now the one aquifer cons consists of a lot of formations and that's probably where <coughs> the confusion comes in. Oh, uh, this is a Cambrian formation, so that's one aquifer. 
No, the sand and gravel on top of the limestone, on top of the sand, on top of the the sandstone, all the way down to bedrock is one aquifer. The water moves through all these different formations, and uh, so <coughs> you you will talk to people who say there's five aquifers over in St. County, Troy County. No, one aquifer. Now, the aquifer is very sensitive to contamination. Nitrate. Where does nitrate come from? Manure, fertilizer, and septic systems. We generally don't think about septic systems providing a source of nitrate. Uh, nitrate has been silently contaminating the aquifers in northwestern Wisconsin. We don't seem to be uh, on, on the situation, okay, what can we do? Uh, they put a map together in Dunn County, and uh, you get a chance to come up and look at it. But it's uh, pretty horrifying. Uh, a lot of areas, it's above 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, Blue baby syndrome, uh, above 10. So, uh, and I think as you talked or first opened up the conversation, you said there's other now illnesses that come from high nitrate. And that, that's being talked about and studied across the nation. Now, they just did a study in uh, Chippewa County, and uh, they collected a lot of water samples, and they said, we have excellent water. But as I read the report, the nitrates are going up. So uh, they may have excellent water except for the nitrate. Now, I call nitrate a red flag. If you have a well where you have high nitrates, watch out. There could be other chemicals in that well water if you have high nitrates. And uh, so, then if you've got high nitrates, you may try to treat for that, but the other constituents, the other chemicals, are probably not be treated and you're drinking it. Now septic systems, we think of septic systems as an ideal system. It is not. It's uh, not much further away from the, the old pit that we used to have years ago, the, the outhouses. And, uh, Everything that goes into the septic system goes out to the drain field. Now the drain field is supposed to break down the bacteria and the viruses, but all the pharmaceuticals pass through. Pass through your tank, pass into the drain field, and down to the groundwater. All the heavy metals that you have in your house, and the heavy metals are all of the makeups. There's heavy metals in there, and you wash that off your face and into the septic and down the drain field. So uh, if you move to a development where there's an, uh, a house on every acre and you have 100 acres, 60% of the recharge could be coming from your drain field. Now take that into consideration. You could be drinking your neighbor's septic. I tried to get a study going uh, a few years back and we got Stout involved and we we're going to go out and collect water samples in these areas where there's a close concentration. And we would test for two things. We would test for a sugar, and we would test for caffeine. None of those are naturally in the water. So if you find caffeine in your well water, you know you're either drinking your own septic or your neighbors. And uh, we couldn't quite get the money to do the study, but I'd still like to see a study launch to do that. Okay, uh, in Dunn County, there's 400 plus uh, land spreading septic sites. These, these septic tanks have to be pumped every two to three years. And they take that septic out and spread it on top of the ground. 400 sites in Dunn County. And I, I looked at those sites and I, I plotted them on a map and came up with 150 sites that do not meet their own regulation. And their own regulation is a percolation rate. And if the percolation rate is greater than six inches an hour, they can't use that as a site. I found 150 sites greater than six, some up to 20 inches an hour. Now you spread your human waste, raw human waste on top of the ground with viruses, bacteria, all the other stuff. 150 of them are going straight down to the aquifer. Now you might say, well, so what? Okay, if you live near one of those and you have a well uh, near one of those sites, Occasionally you might be getting sick, 
and you're going to blame the sickness on what something I ate. And uh, it may not be something you ate. It may be every now and then the contaminants from that waste that's dumped on top of the ground uh, is causing this. If there's 150 sites in Dunn County, can you imagine how many across the state? And obviously they're spread out, so uh, nobody gets excited. Well, that person up there got sick, or this person over there got sick. And uh, we don't say we've got to stop. Now, some states have banned spreading of human waste on top of the ground. Michigan, for example. Florida. Uh, Iowa, in some places, have banned it. Uh, the Canadian provinces are considering banning spreading of septic waste. Uh, I've talked to a number of people at the legislature. As a matter of fact, I contacted every single legislator about our 150 sites here. I said, you need to, you need to stop those. And I talked to the DNR, and uh, I, I can't get anybody to take hold yet, but I haven't given up. Uh, because I think uh, we're, we're, way, we're, we're harming the people near those 150 sites. And that shouldn't be allowed. Now, I, back in 2005, I put together a map. You can see the color map over there. That's a recharge map. So uh, it tells you how fast something will percolate through the ground. I took 91 soil types that are in Dunn County, and I classified them on recharge rates, and I gave five classifications from excellent to poor. And uh, every county should, have, should put together one of those maps. It's not that difficult. I did it uh, on my own as a volunteer, and the county published it, and uh, is now using the map. Now, how do you use the map? Well, if, uh, if an industry wants to come in, uh, in Dunn County, the Board of Adjustments would change the zoning and okay the industry. <coughs> in one of the industries, there was a chance of uh, contaminating the groundwater. That map was used to show that that industry would contaminate the groundwater because it was in a high recharge area. So they turned the industry down. Without that map, what would the Board of Adjustments do? <coughs> Very possibly approve it. It's extremely important that Pierce, St. Croix, all the counties in Wisconsin put together the soils map of percolation. And then you can go, all the green is the highest recharge, up to 20 inches an hour recharge. Now what else, uh, what other value is this map? Uh, I am on the town board of the town of Menominee, and uh, I'm also on the plan commission of the town of Menominee. And I've, we've spent, the plan commission of the town board, we probably spent three years putting together an ordinance. And the ordinance was to protect the groundwater. Without that map, there would be no ordinance. That was the basis of our ordinance. So we have that now, and uh, we, we have a, a list of some 15 to 20 industries that we will not allow in the three highest recharge areas. Uh, you might say, wow, uh, where did you get those things from? Well, the state of Wisconsin has a rule that uh, if a municipality puts in a new well, you must have a zone of protection around that well. And so any new well, they have to, call it, they have to abide by that zone of protection, which means, and they list it probably 15 industries that could not go in that zone of protection around that well. I took the same list that the state used and said, okay, if we need to protect the well, let's protect the aquifer in the three highest recharge areas. So those are the, those are the items I used to protect the groundwater. Another thing we want to protect the groundwater, and our ordinance does that, we want to protect the recharge. Uh, how well is our Recharge, recharge in the aquifer. And so in the highest recharge areas, we want to keep it as green as possible. So in our township, if a developer comes in and wants to develop 100 acres, we first say you're setting 30, 30 acres aside as green space. And then we'll look at that map and say, okay, we want you to set those 30 acres aside in the highest green areas, the highest recharge areas. And uh, the developers screamed and hollered at first, but now it's kind of an accepted thing and uh, uh, we all get along. So when they come with a de development plan of 100 acres, they bring that map and their whole development is laid out on that map. 
So uh, I just encourage to get your county, if you're on the county board or if you're on the town board, get them to get one of these maps for your county. Uh, our township uh, passed the protection of groundwater. Another township has done the same thing. Uh, some townships have looked at that map and said, we're going to change the size of our acreage for uh, housing. And so they've gone up to three, four acres uh, per house. But that's a tough uh, <coughs> road to haul, too, because uh, they want to keep as much farmland as possible. So they don't, don't like the idea of having one house on five acres. So it's a, it's a, a discussion going on back and forth. <coughs> now, uh, the county should do this. The next thing the county should be doing is measuring the water level in, your, in the wells in, in different places around the county. Uh, in Dunn County, Eau Claire County, and Chippewa County, we, study, we started a three-county pilot study. And there's a company out of Milwaukee that makes a device that sits on top of the well and can monitor the water level at any frequency you want. And we started with five in Dunn County and five in each of the three counties as a pilot study to see how successful it is. And I think now we've gone to maybe 10 in the three counties. And as I talk about that, there's a, and I tell the townships, uh, you need one in your township. Use your town well as one of the monitoring devices. Now, why is it important to measure the water level? As we get more and more high capacity wells, the water level starts going down. In, in the aquifer. In the eastern part of the state, from Green Bay to Milwaukee, it's gone down 400 feet. The water level has dropped 400 feet. What happens when the water level goes down? The chemistry of the groundwater changes, and it never changes to the good. In some areas uh, over by Oshkosh, arsenic became a major problem. And the DNR out of Madison said to that township, you got to fix the problem. You can't allow this, all these homes that have wells uh, drinking arsenic levels that are too high, above, above the standard. So uh, that township could have tied into with the drinking water of Oshkosh, which they get their water from Winnebago, yummy. Uh, and they, they didn't quite come to an agreement, so uh, they decided to put their own well down. Oshkosh had a beautiful situation. They had two aquifers. And in some places in Wisconsin, there is multiple aquifers. And there was a nice barrier between those two aquifers. So they went to the deeper one, which was not an arsenic problem, and put in their own well system and uh, provided uh, piping to uh, as much of the township as they could. They had one rule. You could tie in to the new system or you could keep your own well. But all new industries and all new residents had to tie in to their system. And you can think if you ever want to sell your house, it might be good to have tied in to the system. So two things you should encourage your township or county to do. Create the map and start monitoring the water level. Uh, the devices that we put on these wells uh, is about $500. And uh, that's it. It's, it's, uh, the data goes up into a cloud and you can retrieve the data and, and do anything you want to with it. Now, every, uh, every 10 years or so, the water and land conservation in your county does a study. And uh, they always say what things need to be done. And uh, if you go back and look at the reports of way back into time, they say the same thing. We have a groundwater problem. And guess what? When you look across the state of Wisconsin, what has any county or township done to tackle the groundwater problem? Almost nothing. With a map, you can start. You can start protecting your groundwater. So I would recommend this is the first step you do to uh, protect your groundwater. I, I, I think I better quit there. <laughs> Thank you. Can anybody have any questions for Neil? We can probably take a couple questions and then we'll save a bunch for the end. Sure.
if you don't want people spreading the sewage on fields, what can they do with it? Come up with I would say. Uh, First, go to the county board and say, do you know where the land spreading sites are? Uh, I, I spent probably five years working with the DNR to locate the sites. And I first started with the town of Menominee, since I'm on that board, and we had this ordinance. So I wanted to find out if there were any sites in our township that were in the high recharge areas. So then I said, no, I'm going to ask the whole county. <laughs> so I got the 400, list of 400 sites and went through and found 150. But uh, go to your town board or county board and say, I would like to know where the sites are in case there's one right next to me. And uh, the question is, rather than letting them sit on the land if it's a bad place for them to do it, what would you do with it instead? They would take it to the municipal waste treatment plant okay. and it would be processed there. Mm -hmm. Just for information, it's about $150. Uh, to request your septic hauler to take it into the municipal wastewater treatment plant. And as the hauler suggested to me, he says, that's $50 a year. So that's the choice you're making. Uh, the haulers would love to take it to, a, to the municipal because yeah, it's that way they could be pumping more ta tanks and make more money. And I think in Wood County, all the haulers got together and said, we're taking it to the municipality. But you need all the haulers to do it because they will charge you more. But when, if you live in a, I don't know how many live in a city, have you ever looked at your uh, cost of <coughs> utilities? Living in the country, my gosh, $150 every three years, really? Is that a problem? <laughs> it shouldn't be. We talked about uh, water quality, and that's what the meeting is really about, but I was curious as a hydrologist, if you, what your opinion is about, uh, or if there's any concern about irrigation wells, if that's in terms of the water aquifer, the level that is there, should we be concerned about that as well? Yes, and if you're going to put these uh, measuring devices out, I would encourage them to be placed on wells near where there's a lot of irrigation wells. But hopefully we're not lowering our water level too much in, in this area in northwestern Wisconsin. Uh, East Wisconsin, it's horrible. Matter of fact, even in Madison now, they've, uh, they have the same aquifer we have in Madison, the sandstone aquifer. Uh, they've pulled the water level down to the point where the lakes around Madison are now draining into the aquifer instead of the aquifer draining into the lakes. But the chemistry can change. But the irrigation wells, I've monitored them. After they turn the irrigation well off, the water level can right back up. But I did talk to one farmer, he said, since I've been irrigating, this was in Dunn County, my water level has dropped two feet. So we are starting to lower it in high areas of high past the world. So you've created this recharge map for Dunn County. Uh, how would we go about doing that for St. Croix County? I'm sure you have people on board in your county uh, through the Land and Water Conservation Office that uh, you don't have to know a lot about that to do it because the soil reports have listed all of the soils and there was 91 of them coming and in that listing of the soils they show the per they, they name the percolation group. So all you have to do and the soils are all on the computer so it's it's a real simple thing to generate that map. And uh, if you're going to do it in your county, I would hope you would use that map as a as an example. Try to do the same thing. Use the same uh, five units. Maybe use the same uh, recharge percolation rates, and that way we'll have some uniformity around the state. But it's not. And I'd be glad to help if there's a county that I'd be glad to come and get them started. Have you ever been <clears throat> challenged on your recharge? map in terms of credibility from um, people who don't want to use that as the basis for I, decision making? Before that map went out, it went to the uh, U.S. Soil Conservation Service. They went through it. Uh, it wasn't just me doing it. So a level of certification because, I, I mean, I can see if you don't have that, that's going to be the first line of uh, disagreement. Mm -hmm. 
So no, nobody since the map has been out, nobody's challenged it. But I, I did go through a process. We can take more questions for him. Or Neil's been very gracious. He's traveled the state, and he's very gracious to talk to you about groundwater. So feel free to come up and talk to him afterwards. <laughs> so, Be glad to. Yes. Yeah, so come up and take you. a closer look at the map. Yes, you can get a personal and, tour of the map. <laughs> and the highest nitrates on this map are in the highest recharge areas. You can see the correlation. Well, thank you, Neil, very much. So up next, did I see Rob Staffolds come in? Oh, there he is. He's hiding in the back. Okay. So we want to thank Rob for allowing us to bring in the DNR folks here. Rob, do you need to say anything? Okay. So um, for those of you who live in the country, you probably have noticed how farming has changed over the past 10, 15 years with uh, more and more of the larger industrial type producers and fewer and fewer of the smaller farmers. And so farming has changed, so we need to change some ways on how we do things. The DNR has had to keep up. I think there was, maybe I'm stealing some of Leah's thunder, there was probably 50 CAFOs, large 1,000 plus animal units, probably in about 2,000. Okay, she's gonna talk about that. Well, there's a lot more now. <laughs> and so, so I really am thankful. These are our frontline people, Leah Nickel and Dan Bauman here from the DNR. And they, I asked them to come tonight and just explain the process of what it takes to permit a CAFO, what are the hurdles you guys, the challenges you have, where's the public opportunity for input, and just explain to folks how you do your job, a 5,000 foot view. Thank you. All right, I'm Leah Nickel. I'm uh, the regional CAFO runoff specialist. I'm based out of Eau Claire. It, but um, I go from Pepin County all the way up to Bayfield. So I'll show you the, the coverage that I have right now. So this is kind of a CAFO 101. And it's, you know, we're going to go through some slides because it's a lot of stuff. And so, you know, I've given this talk to Douglas County and to Dunn County for their um, study that they had on CAFOs and so if there's something that you want to ask I just raise your hand during so we can make the most out of it. So here's kind of what we're going to talk about. We could really go in any direction but what is a CAFO? A little bit about the WPDS program which I'll explain all these acronyms and then a little I don't want to get too far into nutrient management, but we will talk about it because it's very important as it pertains to groundwater and surface water. And then a little bit about our current staffing um, and kind of my county coverage. So uh, I would hope everybody knows what a CAFO is. So a CAFO is just an acronym for a concentrated animal feeding operation. It's a thousand animal units or over that requires a permit through DNR. And you can kind of see the breakdown. So it's just based off of a, a, a weight and how much waste is produced from an animal unit. So I kind of break it down here. So right now, as of, let's see, today's Wednesday, so Monday morning, I got the current number of permitted facilities and applications in-house. So right now we have 296 permitted facilities in Wisconsin and 39 are planning to become a CAFO or are already in that process. And I'm sure there's all these unknown amounts of farms in the state that are over a thousand. We just haven't found them yet. I know where some of them are though. I'm working on it. Another, what we consider capable is not necessarily having a thousand animal units, they can be under as well. Depending on their operation, there are a couple of farms in Wisconsin that have a WPDS permit and they don't have a thousand animal units. So it's kind of based off of if they have or have had a direct discharge to an navigable waterway. Um, 
So all the photos in here are personally taken. Uh, this is a this is a small farm in. This is not a permitted facility, however. But this is a, what we would consider a you know a, a, I guess a small farm in northern Dunn County. And this is a stream of manure coming off of the production site up here and is hitting a Charles Street. So this would be an instance where we would want to work with this farm, you know, where DNR would get involved too. We could offer them a whole variety of different programs um, or they could decide to go through the permit route. So, yeah, a small farm, what we call small farm is anywhere from 0 to 299 animal units and a medium farm is 300 right to 1,000. So I wish this was bigger. This is our most current, what we have published, a map of the cables in Wisconsin. So I don't think that there's 296 plus, but you can kind of get a feel for where they're at. So everybody hears about this Kiwani County right here. So the Northeast region is pretty popular. This is what we call the Northeast region. And I want to note that there's, it's hard to see, but there's 37 triangles. Those the Genio Turkey stores. And they're spread out various counties. Um, so those are all under my coverage area too. Typically the little triangles for turkey source is just one barn. However, there's a lot of animals in there, but so what is kind of the WPDS permit program? So it's a water quality protection permit based on the federal NPDS permit program. And I kind of define what NPDS and WPDS mean. And it got weird here. Sorry. Um, okay, let me read what that is here. Do you know why we've gotten funky here? No. Okay. So what the what does the permit regulate? It regulates CAFO manure and processed wastewater, the impact to waters of the state, groundwater, including groundwater, surface water, and wetlands. That's what's hidden in this. But it does not regulate air, odor, noise, or traffic impacts. <coughs> so Wisconsin has been implement, implementing their program since 1984, and compared to other states, Wisconsin is really has a really strong program, um, which I think is important when you think about it nationwide. Um, we also have a really great nutrient management software that the University of Wisconsin developed. It's called SNAP Plus, and it is an agronomic system. However, it does do water quality in it. So this is the tool that farmers can use to maximize their yields with the least amount of fertilizer that they need, including manure and everything else. So we, we have a lot of tools to our advantage here. Can't see that one. Okay, so if farms thinking about being a CAFO, they haven't reached the 1,000 animal units yet, but they're thinking about it. We want an initial application of one year prior to them reaching this number. And then, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of components that are a, a part of the application process. And then we, what we want is this final application. So in the, in the initial stage, it's like, hey, this is who we are. We're kind of thinking about it. The regional person gets assigned to them, kind of go out, go over everything at their farm, kind of see where the direction is going, and help them into this application process so that they can meet all of the requirements. So things included in the application process are uh, plans and specifications of all new structures and evaluations of engineering evaluations of their existing systems, 
and a five-year nutrient management plan from this point forward moving out five years. Tell me how much manure you're going to generate, where is it going to go, do you have appropriate land base. And then we also work, um, it's kind of hard to see too, but we have, you know, it's the farm's responsibility to make sure that they have the town, the county permits covered too, but we kind of work all together with the, you know, I work really close with my local counties to make sure, like, do you guys know that, you know, this farm is moving towards this direction, and can you be of service to them to help them get where they want to go? Now everything is submitted electronically, so we don't have any more paper problems with things getting lost. So anything a farm now wants to submit is online. Oh, I got some weird stuff here. I'm sorry about the, the weird pictures. Um, okay, so the production area is kind of where we, and I'll show you a picture of a, what we call the production area. So this is where all the stuff is happening. So it's kind of like the farm site, what we call the production area. So we want zero discharge, or no discharge, in quotation marks, uh, to navigable waters. Uh, another requirement is that all CAFOs must have 180, at least 180 days of liquid manure storage at all times. Uh, hidden underneath that is nutrient management plans. So like the how, when, where, amounts of manure and process wastewater is land applied. And this is a self-reporting program, so they are self-monitoring and self-reporting. That is required by DNR annually or upon request, but it is, you know, they're, well, we use this as a tool. We offer this CAFO calendar, and it, it includes things that they're doing on a daily, weekly, quarterly basis of, you know, are you checking all of the drains? Are you checking your water lines? What, monitoring the level of your, the manure in your lagoons, and on and on. We do require some sort of a proof annually. Did you go through it and make sure that you checked all these things? Yeah, Leah, did you just find navigable waters? No, I refuse to do it. <laughs> 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 In general, it's uh, a stream that has a defined bed and bank. So there's a some type of channel, and it flows on a frequently enough basis. Spring uh, it doesn't have to be perennial. I have flow in it all the time, but it has enough flow to uh, create that bed and bank and float a small craft at a certain time of the year, like in the spring when there's runoff. Um, it's mostly defined by case law, not by statute so much, but there's a lot of case law out there that defines what is navigable and what is not. So it's a process that uh, someone on our staff works with a property owner who's applying for a permit to identify is this water navigable, uh, either in fact or through stream history. So you're pretty much saying if in the spring you can put a canoe in it, and go a few hundred feet, that's navigable. But it has to have a defined bed and bank. Right, yeah. So it does have some criteria. Uh -huh. And it's really not so much about being able to navigate it, but it's more about is there a public interest in where that water's going? Right. <coughs> yeah. Does that, when you're talking about it in those terms, does the stream have to be navigable from its source to wherever it empties, because nope. some rivers are not. Correct. Along, so. Yep, generally uh, not all, you know, uh, these tributaries or a ditch may not be <laughs> navigable, but it may lead to somewhere that is navigable. And so uh, if it leads along. to a navigable stretch, then it is considered navigable. No, it may not be. It's it's pretty case specific. So uh, a ravine in someone's back 40, although it uh, if you dumped a bunch of water in it, it may get to say the Kinnikinnik. It doesn't mean that that ditch is navigable. 
it actually has to be navigable in fact, and that's where the canoe or the smallest craft comes in. So it's, it's, it's hard to explain, and that's why I don't uh, blame Mia for saying, not me, uh, because it, it does take someone trained in doing these determinations to make that determination. Uh, hydrology, um, hydraulics, um, you know, geomorphology, it takes that kind of background to figure out exactly. There's some that's obvious. The St. Croix is navigable at Hudson, for sure. Um, but there's areas of the headwaters of the Kinnikinnik or the Rush um, that may have a trickle of water in it but not have a defined bed and bank. And even if it was running full, you couldn't float a canoe. So, We've done some navigability determinations within production sites on CAFOs before. So, you know, it might not be really clear, but we bring in our experts to come in and say, okay, we're looking at this stretch. It's running right through the middle of this farm. Tell us if this is navigable or not. Because now it gets a little bit more severe for the CAFO if they do have a discharge to this area. Good questions. I have a question about, uh, you said manure storage uh, must be uh, capable of uh, holding 100 days worth? 100. 180. Six months. So half a year. Yeah. Um, and isn't it true, though, that the new construction uh, of, uh, of those um, manure pits are, are typically, they're going to um, a year's worth of storage? Is that happening in this area? We do. I do have one farm that I've been to uh, last week, and they have over a year's worth of storage. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the minimum is 180 days. I got some guys at 182, you know, and it's a calculation, so plus or minus, you know, rain and, events. And how much rainfall does that take into consideration? I mean, in other words, if you're... If you have a five-inch rainfall, twenty-five year, twenty-four hours total. So, so if you had a five-inch rainfall within a few, uh, within a, a day, would that then lead to? Uh, I mean, does it have a capacity for that kind of rainfall? It isn't designed for that. That would be above the twenty-five year. So we're getting, yeah. I think where you're going. I mean, so you know, if it happens. It's like a, this game where the, the farms have to play this really vicious game where, especially this time of year, they have stored all of their manure, let's just say, they got some out in the spring, they're still generating it some every day. The crops are all growing, we've had a late harvest, and now we have frost. So they still have to get down to their mark to make sure that they're covered all winter. So if they've had a couple of these four inch, five inch, whatever, rains, they need to be paying attention. It's always this teeter-totter game where they need to get more manure out quickly. I want to make sure I understand this. You're, I'm going to use your example of there's this ravine, which is not navigable waters. But let's say there's this huge manure leakage, or it's fairly constant that goes to this non-navigable water, which if with the rain or whatnot, goes to navigable water. Sure. So how is that handled? Well, any spill is handled separately, it's, regardless of whether it's navigable or non-navigable. It's yeah. Let's say it's not a spill. This is just what they do, but it gets to navigable water very easily. Some of that, if it's within the nutrient management plan, there's manure hitting in a rainfall that happens. It does happen. And some of it, uh, if it was in uh, an act of uh, either mismanagement, something along those lines, we have spill response that goes there. If it's in the everyday uh, management and you put it on as dry one day and you get rain the next day and it, some of it washes to the navigable water, there's really no regulatory unless you get a fish kill or something along those lines that uh, we have authority to do anything about, nor would we likely hear anything about. There's when it rains, streams get muddy, or they get dark, that's for sure. Uh, soil as well as anything else that was on the land. But navigable, the definition doesn't weigh into that very well. 
<coughs> we don't want many we're going anywhere except right. on the field for crop uptake. However, okay, so in this last slide, I have um, this mysterious no discharge with the quote. This kind of explains it. So if the farm, here's a picture of a lagoon. So they've designed this to hold all of the manure, all of the processed wastewater from anything that they have, even including the first flush from their feed storage area and the 25 year, 24 hour storm event. If there is a loss of the 100 year rain event where this exceeds, they're exempt from having, well, they're exempt. Enforcement. Yeah. One thing I want to add real quick about that 25 year, 24 hour is that the, in the statute, which is where a lot of these rules come from, they're using data from 1961. And it's a really important thing to know. And I know that you, in your permits, you can choose to use the, but that's an important thing to do when you look at a permit. Ask the permit writer if they're using current data. Because there's been, in some places, have actually less rainfall. Yeah, when you look at the, but it's um, important to ask that question. Where are they getting the data from the 25 year, 24 hour rainfall event? It's from 61 or 2014. I don't know if this is an appropriate um, question or not, but do you feel that you're adequately staffed in order to monitor these permits? I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> Uh, I'll explain where where our goal is and where um, we're averaging and where Leo's at. So then you can kind of maybe paint the picture from there. Okay, so what is a permit? So it's five year permit term. Uh, anytime that we are drafting a permit, we send it out for public notice. So we'll hit the paper. There's a 30 day public notice period. If a hearing is, this is where the, the public piece comes out. Um, we need five signatures for people to gather and request a public hearing. And this is where they can present um, anything or any data or questions or information to the department that we would respond to. Does it also uh, go out of delivery? Like if people aren't looking at the newspaper all the time, our public notices are on our website, yes. and someone can sign up to always get yes. notified whenever one of these goes out. So it's yep. not like you got to scan the paper every day. You just have to go to the DNR's website, go to Gov Delivery, the little mailbox at the bottom, and then sign up that says, I want to see everyone that comes out, whatever I don't your think interests are. Right now, it's specific, like if you just select St. Kirk County, I don't think that you can just get that. I think you get everybody. Right. But then all of the documents come with it. So the, the permit, the, um, the public notice itself, and then like a permit fact sheet. Site you inspections. Know, do you think that are the people going to the sites and are they, are they looking those up? Are they From my these, experience so far, I think people are watching, yes. Mm -hmm. At least in this uh, western, northwestern Wisconsin, I everybody knows when one comes out. <laughs> And, you know, because I, when I started, there was a vacancy for quite a few years, so a lot of permits had to get reissued. So they were already existing farms. Um, a lot of permits had to get reissued, and it was kind of overwhelming for people to be like, what is going on? You know, there's so much action, but we're just trying to get caught up. Site inspections are a part of the permit. Now, um, it, w it was one every five years. Now it's either, well, we're going to be requiring two times per permit term at least. Anytime a farm wants you to come out, and with things changing on the farm all the time, I think we'll be out there a lot more. Um, within the permit, we can have construction schedules. So they, let's see. Um, Uh, okay, for an easy one, we'll just 
skip the construction <coughs> schedules, but I got a farm and they need to develop a better monitoring and inspection plan for themselves. I can put in the permit schedules that they are supposed to follow. So if they need to either upgrade their facility, whatever the situation may be, this can be a part of their permit where they might not have it the day that it's issued, but it's going to be happening within a few years of the permit. Is there a useful life for a lagoon? Because I'm thinking if I'm a farm that has an <coughs> existing lagoon for 800 head and I want to expand, I'm assuming I'm going to continue using the lagoons I have, and then the expansion is going to be new lagoons? Not necessarily. Not necessarily? Okay. So what's the useful life, getting back to my first question? It's you, kind the septic of like systems a, for homes fail, drain fields yes, fail. Yes, and, and so do manure. I would homes. expect they would. Yes. Um, I would say that the majority of this CAFO shift has... I mean, you know, a lot of the, it seemed like the turning point was in the beginning of the 2000s. So now we're almost talking about 20 years. And how well does H, you know, those HDPE plastic lines? <coughs> yeah, even concrete, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, manure lagoons can legally leak 500 gallons per acre per day. So it's in the statute. So depending on how big I and mean, the manure lagoon is, you know, it depends. So there's a certain amount of, I mean, I think it's kind of built into the permitting program. To well, right. So the 313 standard is an NRCS standard that if you're going to build a new lagoon, you have to follow everything that's in, we call it the 313. So the, the code 313. The requirements for a lagoon is having a operation and maintenance plan for 10 years. Then it kind of gets into <coughs> this strange area. 30 years, I think, is a nightmare. And, but it's kind of, well, <laughs> everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the picture that I showed of the manure stream, that pit that they're using was from 1969. Who knows what's going on with that one? I don't know. So it's kind of a little bit based off of discretion, as if, you know, once you're working with this farm, tell me about the facility. All of mine are brand new to me because I'm just trying to get to them all. But yeah, we're going to be talking about this now to have it evaluated. And we can request evaluations based on age of structures. And I think that's an important piece that, yeah. How do they know the significance of the leak? Do they routinely drain these out that they would be able to look for leaks? Or That's a good question. We've had the occasion where there's been, uh, where the monitoring that happens, groundwater monitoring around uh, a storage facility, you see changes in the monitoring results. And we have required uh, pits to be drained to identify why that is. So monitoring is at the production site is something that we do require, correct? And uh, collecting those samples and seeing changes in those samples give us an indication of what's going on, how much it's leaking, what it's leaking, which direction the groundwater flow is, those kind of things, which yeah. is part of the permit process, correct? But I'm thinking, right, that's all right, but I'm, th you know, I'm thinking of situations where we have a lot of underground or under barn storages where you can't really see because it's under the barn. So can you see what's going on, you know? I don't know. So that's where, like, just based off of age, we could require evaluations where soil borings and stuff would need to get <coughs> taken place so that they can figure out what that's going And just real quickly, we still, there's two different types of WPDS permits, um, the individual and the general, so it's, I still don't really have a full grasp on this, but the general permit is the same exact permit. This is just an easier way for them to get reissued. We have um, 
I think there's 10 in the northwestern counties that have this general permit that they're backlogged. Um, does the general so, permit have a public participation process? Yes, yeah, same. Does. So I don't know if anybody is even thinking along those lines, but it's still, now we're kind of moving on towards individual. It means the same exact thing. It was just a matter of how they're issued um, for staffing ease. And these are turning out to be more of a head and head. So we're kind of staying away from that. Am I okay on time or should I go? Okay. Yeah, so we're kind of, I'll kind of walk over a site inspection. So yeah, I, I have a lot to go. Yes. <laughs> Here's one of the sites I have in Barron County. I put together an inspection report after I go over. So I normally do a full perimeter, look at each lagoon, how all of the, where the manure flows go, where the storm water goes, how all of these stuff, these little pieces put, put everything together for the farm. So at the 5,000 foot elevation, there's an on-site. Our folks are out there with a reissuance or with a renewal, or if they have more animal units that they want to increase their number, it requires the department specialists like Leah to go out and do the inspection, the walk through, those kind of things. It's not an automatic by any means. Um, she's out there to follow uh, the process that the department has for re reissuance or issuance. That's probably the 5,000 foot take home. Yep, so for plants and specs, what is supposed to be submitted for engineering review, we have four DNR engineers on staff that just specifically do CAFO reviews and evaluation, so we're looking at these types of things right here. We don't look at barns. I think that's the biggest thing right now. We do not review barn um, plans. Yeah, we kind of talked about this. This is some of the uh, self-reporting stuff that's done by the permittee. I kind of hit this earlier. But it is self-reporting. So that's how the system is set up. The CAFO self-reports, have they met these things? Are they, in between our inspections anyway, um, having to identify and certify that they're meeting the permit conditions? And how, how often are the reports submitted to you? Annually. Annually? January 31st and March 31st. That's when they submit them. But the, the monitoring they have to do, much like you saw on the calendar, every day is every day <coughs> and then they summarize and then they have to submit annually so somebody asked one of these questions um so all this stuff they cannot it cannot run off the application site or the production site <coughs> cannot discharge to waters of the state like tile lines or something um and then there's some other restrictions in here. Is this, on, okay, so on areas with less than 24 inches to bedrock and groundwater, that seems like a, like 24 inches is probably not enough to put manure down before it hits groundwater. Right. So they need, if they have, so it's just based on soil type. So if that soil type is indicating that this could happen where there's less than 24 right. inches, they need to verify that. Um, I think it's, there's a certain amount of requirements of test pits that they need to dig within that field to verify before they can spread. Right. But let's say they come out, yeah, it's 26 inches, we're good. I'm thinking that's not enough. So, how do we change that? <laughs> good question. Elect new people. <laughs> yes. 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 There's a lot of different spreading restrictions. We call this SWIC law, which is a surface water quality management area, 1,000 feet from a lake, 300 feet from a stream. And there's all different setbacks to wetlands and conduits to groundwater, to a surface water. I recently learned about the injection system for this liquid manure. Can you speak about that, explain what it is, and maybe what the pros and cons are? For injecting? Like, just in general? Yeah, I, I never, I didn't know about it until this year. Okay, so I would say that the majority of CAFOs inject the manure 
So they have a hose coming directly from their lagoon to a tractor that has this implement on the back. And typically it goes seven inches down, so it's like these large shanks that the hose is hooked up to the back of the tractor. The manure goes seven inches down, so it's buried. So it's a pretty common practice. Now with the shift of soil health, cover crops, everything like that, uh, you know, another thing is that there's also nitrogen leaching that could happen. So you're gaining more by injecting, depending on how you look at it. The guys that are wanting to do more soil health, not till the soil, or they have a cover crop going, they're trying to find alternative ways for land applying their manure, sort of using that system. So there's the new, this is just a brand new, there's a lot of research to be done yet, and I think there's not enough um, tools out there for the, for the farmers that want to do the soil health piece. Does that answer your question? I mean, it's really, really common where you inject. Yeah, knifing it in, mm -hmm. basically. Putting it on a chisel plow and putting it behind it. Yeah, the injection tools, though, are really like, they're, I mean, it's a tube that goes down in seven inches, and they're just pumping that right seven inches down. I, I guess I'm, what are the pros and cons? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, so if you're trying to maximize your nitrogen for your crop, good. If you want to minimize odor, good. <laughs> if the bad, if you... You know, liquid manure, uh, you can also, a, a plus is you can apply more of a higher rate at one time. When you hit a surface application, a lot more risks happen. However, you're saving soil health and um, there's a lot more order that ha happens with surface applications. I think there's an economic piece to it as well. So uh, you don't have trucks running all the time. It's pushed through a, a hose, um, so you eliminate the big 5,000 gallon, you know, uh, implements that are pulled and are on the roads all the time. So really quickly, I'll just get through this stuff. So we have 23 and a half staff positions, um, and this kind of breaks down. So there's 15 regional people like me. There's two current vacancies and one in this region right now. Uh, the Permittee has a fee charge for their permits, it's $345. And so what what we had proposed, and I think our goal is about 20 CAFOs per person, per regional staff person. And right now our current workload is around anywhere from 22 to 40. And I have 35, and $95 comes back to the port. I don't really know where that goes, but it comes back to the port. Is the vacancies, are they funded? Well, they're not filled. <laughs> I didn't know there's a difference between filled and funded. Well, if you look at 200 and how many capos? Well, there's like 340. 340, you do the math, at 300 and some dollars annually per, that doesn't pay for much staffing. Mm -hmm. right. So it isn't a self-funded program. Is the state funding the two positions that are open? So you have the money for it, so you could, if you get the proper applicant, oh. it'll get paid for, or is it just yeah, saying, you know, it should yeah. be filled, but the state's not going to give you any money? Well, I know that in the governor's last budget, uh, the one that was just passed, we directed additional staff to this program. So if we had vacancies, I think the directive through the executive budget was this program should be filling. That's why we brought staff there. Where they're at in the process, I don't know. Uh, what the funding source is for them, I don't know that either. But all that information is very, if um, I can get it, um, if it's important. But uh, the governor did have a directive to the department to add four staff to this program and, and um, have more inspections. And there was quite an effort through his budget. Did you know the last time the permit cost was increased? <laughs> 
I don't know. I don't know if it's ever been increased. Yeah, I don't. Is that a DNR decision or a legislative decision? No, all those fees are in statute, what permits cost, that kind of stuff. I've been reading articles about um, transferring the CAFO program from the DNR to the DAC cap. Is that still being talked about or is that Rob's question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say that's still being talked about. There's no direct avenue to that yet, but that's a that's not a process. Okay, thank what, you. What legislator is sponsoring that? Uh, it's not sponsored, it's just a talk. Walker put it in his northern Wisconsin um, rural talk he did a couple weeks ago, dropped it back down. He was in the budget, and Cowles took it out because they moved on non-fiscal things from the budget, and Walker put it back in. One thing I want to say about the DNR, because I've been dealing with these folks for a long time, and we have to understand, this is a legislator that is doing When you see 345 bucks, when you hear 40 capos per person, it's not these guys. It's the people that we elected. And in particular, you also need to look at Act 21, which is an incredibly important tool that took away their authority to make robust rules. And so again, this stuff's happening in Madison. Those people come up for election every two years. That's what we need to do. We're so unaware of when these are going to be discussed. I know, we gotta get more aware. They don't want us to be aware. I mean, that's the thing, it's like, so, we can't. We have to be hyper engaged right now. You have to learn the rules of the road if you have any hope of busting the rules up, so they can be better for everybody. And because an adequately funded CAPA, I mean, I've looked at how big the applications are. Because there's other button on the website you can press. It's like thousands of pages. Three hundred forty-five bucks can be a break. That's ridiculous. I mean, who's making the money? It's the people. I mean, it's just it's crazy. Compared, and that could be changed. Compared to the price of, a, of putting in a lagoon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 345 like, bucks is not. It's nothing, man. A lot of us supposed to fund the program so that people can do the work. Uh, in a manure pit, uh, are, besides the water, the manure, I don't know what else you need, uh, cycling the process, water cycling, I think you mentioned in your grant, are farmers allowed to accept anything else? from an outside firm put in their pit. Yes. Why and what is it? So with the, most commonly what they're accepting is whey water. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of farms up there that it helps flush their system so to speak. So I have one farm in Barron County they accept and this is all permitted, you know, with the industrial wastewater folks and the CAFO program working together. But yeah, they will accept industrial wastewater, so to speak, to help flush their system. Okay, how broad is that definition of industrial wastewater? I don't, I'm not the Can one to... Can a paper mill dump water? Can a metal manufacturing site dump water? Well, typically, they. I wouldn't say that most farms accept that type of material when they're at this size because they're worried about their own levels. You know, th these guys aren't funding themselves for having two years of storage because it's an ungodly amount of money. So they're right at this cutoff where they feel comfortable. I, I brought that up because the farmer from Kewanee County two weeks ago at the Clear Forum said, you know, check your county ordinances. Can that happen? And if it can, what are the things that are going into these pits? So the times I've seen it <coughs> are the farm, the, I'm going to say non cables that got rid of all the cows because the farm retired, and the pit's just sitting there. So the farm will accept whatever at, in, for payment. They could take up to 10% of the whatever gal, however much they have in the pit, not like full capacity. Who's it? You're, you're talking to Lynn Utesh, was he the one talking about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again,
again, you know, it just comes down to like, yeah, this stuff seems outrageous, but guess what? It's done by elected officials. I mean, figure it out. Look at the statute. Figure out what language makes you uncomfortable. Talk to people in your community and communicate that with the elected officials. Because it is kind of goofy, but I mean, it can be changed. Well, thank you very much to you guys. Sorry, it was late. No. having them here so you can see their faces and know that there's real bodies there and <laughs> you can tell how technical this gets very quickly and so I really appreciate your service to our state thank you all right Barb Nelson is on the Planning Commission for the Emerald Township and she was gracious enough to sit on the county's groundwater study committee that we had over the past nine months and so I've asked Barb to come and just give a brief recap of what the county ended up with after nine months of meetings twice a month. I will be brief. I'm not going to go through the entire um, document, but I do want to share with you as a little bit about how the water study committee came to be um, before it, the members joined the group. Um, uh, back over a year ago, October 20th, the Community Development Committee had a um, consideration of a moratorium on a new or expanded large-scale livestock facilities. They had an open hearing and from that um, sent a recommendation to the County Board on the moratorium. December 6th of 2016, the County Board held a public hearing on the moratorium ordinance. Um, there was a motion to amend it, which was done, and the original resolution was changed, or moratorium, resolution on the moratorium was changed to create a special study group to address nutrition, pollution, hyphen, large livestock facilities. The group was formed. Um, the first meeting was held January 10th of this year. There were nine members three county board members, three alternates, six citizens, one representing a CAFO, one a medium farm, one a small farm, one a CSA, and two rural members, non-farmers. Um, I was one of those members. They met two times a year throughout um, until September 26th. All the meetings, except for one, were videotaped and they are archived on the county website. I would encourage you, if you didn't watch them before, if you um, have time, pop some popcorn, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> it's on and off, but you know, they are all archived. They were, we had a lot of terrific um, speakers on a variety of, of topics um, and a wealth of information um, given at those meetings. You can, you can find those on the county website, which has recently been updated. It's www.sccwi.gov. I'll write it on the board later. Oh, is it? Okay, excellent. So you've got it right there. You just go to the upper left-hand side, click on um, County Board of Supervisors, and then click on Agendas and Meetings, and you can get all of those pieces. The, there should be, hopefully you grabbed in the back, some handouts which identify um, the final recommendations. The committee um, established an overarching goal that reads to provide St. Croix County Board with sound, science-based recommendations for policies that protect the quality of the water supply that our county residents rely upon for personal household use and consumption. The decision by the committee was to, to address pollution of water resources in general, not in a specific area, not related to a specific group or cause, but in general. Um, there's, in the final report, 54 pages, some good night time reading, 
Um, it lists all of the speakers, all of the topics. Um, it's pretty well laid out. It's divided into eight parts. Part one is on the groundwater situation in St. Croix County. <coughs> Part two is regulation and management of surface and groundwater. Three is the capabilities and programs in St. Croix County to protect our groundwater <coughs> or protect our water quality. Four is on POUTS, which is the private on-site wastewater treatment system. Five is wells. Six is nutrient management plans. Seven, livestock siting and operations. And eight is the whole compilation of data and tools and studies that have been done. Like I said, a wealth of information in there. Each section defines the main findings, and from the main findings came the eight core recommendations um, that the committee selected. You will find those. Like I said, there's some copies in the back, maybe you've gotten them, which um, here might be front and back. But it talks a little bit about the process, but also what the um, final recommendations were. You can read those. I'm not going to read those for you. They are also listed in here in detail in terms of, um, along with the complete um, findings and or complete set of recommendations. So where does it go from here? The report was presented to the county board on October 3rd. They accepted the report and um, sent it forward for further action. It was forwarded to the Community Development Committee and on the 19th of October they discussed it and agreed that they needed to move forward um, in a timely manner in making progress. They also requested that the Community Development Department make an analysis of the estimated time range that it will take, the staff needs, and other costs to implement the, um, or the core, core recommendations. The Community Development Committee meets tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the um, government center, so if you're interested in going and um, hearing the discussion, you can go in person or you can see it online. If you go online to the Community Development Committee's um, site, you can read or you can run off a copy. It's a seven-page document related to the cost related to the eight core um, recommendations. I will set these out. You can peruse them at your leisure tonight, or you can go home and look at them on the computer or get your own copies. The next chapter of of the um, committee is dependent on um, what goes forward with the um, committees. Uh, right now, there's no mandate nor archiving um, of well testing in surrounding areas. And given the type of um, bedrock that we have, uh, it can travel great distances and you'll see a polluted well. Uh, is there any consideration at all for some mandated and some structured way of uh, evaluating uh, for wells? Um, there is. The county does have um, some historical data and um, well testing that has been done through the county they have access to. Um, part of the, one of the recommendations is, um, as Neil had talked about, is um, having wells um, to monitor, so we can monitor and know what's going on with our water. Um, and that's in the four recommendations to have a continuation expansion of that. So, so the NR also has a, a database because we uh, regulate the municipal and other than municipal, like the trailer courts, rural bars, churches as transient uh, non-community systems. So all that data is recorded as well, and there's a CD that's put together annually. But this isn't uh, mandatory uh, reporting, is it? It is. By individuals? It is. No, not for individuals, yeah. but for these uh, businesses <laughs> or municipals, it is mandatory. 
Because I was just thinking if somebody uh, well suddenly became polluted that they were planning to sell their house out oh, somewhere, we don't have any way of tracking that something happened. Not not against the owner, mm -hmm. but yeah. there is no way of encouraging people to be uh, checking on their property. Uh, if I can address that, we are considering adding uh, well disclosure data to uh, sales contracts on land. That's done in Minnesota. So if anybody has sold property in Minnesota, you have to disclose where your wells are. And that way, we can catch the abandoned wells too. And if you fail to report it, then there's consequences for that. Well, thank you, Barry. Oh, one more question. Um, I'm not really familiar with, with the situation that led to this effort, um, but I just want to ask, given that the state legislature is, water quality is under assault in this state, um, all the regulations are being rolled back, et cetera, et cetera, what is your hope that what you've done, all this effort you've done, will lead to what? I mean, what? Given the structure of the government in this state and the fact that the legislature is anti-regulation, what is your hope? Our, I think our hope is that our water in St. Croix County and beyond remain safe um, for all for all of us. Through what uh, mechanism? I mean, what what are you hoping is done structurally at the you know by the county or state government that, that works on your behalf? Well, one of, I, mean, I think one of the programs, Debbie's going to talk about um, testing, water testing, for, you know, for private individuals. Mm -hmm. um, that that is certainly one of the programs that's, that's being recommended. There's a, a broad array of programs being recommended um, for protecting, protecting the water, um, ensuring protecting from contaminated sources. Oh, I, I was on the committee as well, and I, um, we spent a lot of time finding out what we could not do as a county because it was not legal. We were not allowed. Um, so I think for for myself on the committee, we hope that we did we we are doing what we can do, and we also talked about um, getting. Having you know, other books from the county, giving the message to the state that we want to change, <clears throat> so that we have more power what we can do locally. But <clears throat> you're right, our hands are tied. We got a vote. Mm -hmm. Vote. <coughs> All right, next up is our public health, our current public health director for St. Croix County is Deb Lindemann. I wanted, in case you didn't know her, I wanted you to meet her. Usually, if somebody unfortunately ends up with a bad water test, Call public health. It's <laughs> the first thing to do. So I wanted Deb to come so you could see her and she could explain what's next. I'm just going to talk very briefly about testing your water. Um, and can I just ask how many people in the last year have tested your water? Oh, that's really good. That's good. Very good. Okay. That's the goal. That's one of our goals because you don't know. What you can't. Um, you, know, you can't fix it or control it if you don't know what's going on. So it's really important to test your water <coughs> annually. And um, the best time to test probably is like in the spring when um, there's a big snow melt, that kind of um, thing. Or you want, also want to test if, you, um, if your water smells funny or if you notice something in your water, um, anything like that. Any change in your water, you might want to test also then. So most people will test for, um, you test for bacteria and nitrates, <coughs> probably the main things to test for. Um, and um, so if, you're, if you test your water for bacteria and it comes back, coliform um, bacteria is in your water. And that just means that coliform bacteria is present in the soil and in the vegetation and in some surface water. So if it comes back coliform positive, it's getting in somewhere. But it doesn't mean necessarily you don't have like some dangerous bacteria. But it does indicate that if it's if this coliform bacteria is getting in your well, then more dangerous bacteria can also be getting in. So um, that's one thing. Usually, labs that if, if a lab tests your water and gets a coliform positive, they will then go on and test for E. coli. And if it's E. coli positive, 
then that, that is a serious health risk. So um, you do not want to drink your water. If you have an E. coli positive test, do not drink your water, drink bottled water. Um, you might want to think about how you collected your water sample when you, when you did your test. Make sure that you um, were accurate in, in, in how you collected it. Make sure that you uh, followed all the directions. One of the, the um, handouts that are back there are, there's a couple of handouts on how to collect a water sample and it'll tell you exactly what steps to take and where, what faucet to use and how to, um, you wanna flame the faucet. There's, there's several steps, so you wanna think back. You get a positive test, think back about, did I do something wrong in that, you know, when I collected the sample? And then you might wanna go ahead and, and send in another sample right away. But in the meantime, of course, you don't want to, um, you don't want to drink the water and then uh, um, the first thing, another thing you should do is go out and take a look at your well. Um, I'm not a, an expert on inspecting the well, but um, there also is a handout back there what, what to look for. Um, you want to look for, kind of overview the whole water system, make sure the well cap is on securely, make sure the casing is intact, make sure that nothing's underwater, you don't want the casing underwater. Look also around your well. Is there um, ponding of water around your well? Um, and if that happens, that could be just a, you know, a simple fix of lands re-landscaping so the water isn't pulling in. Um, you wanna check your um, pressure tank, make sure there's no rusted areas, no rusted holes. And um, also, you know, look at where you took the sample again, make sure it's a good faucet, make sure that you took the aerator off. It's the little screen that's on the faucet and make sure that you um, flamed that area too before you took your sample. So if you, if, if you still have some questions or some issues, you can call us at Public Health. We have an environmental health specialist, Ed Thurman, and he does, he contracts, uh, we contract with the DNR to do the transient non-community well testing, and Ed inspects well, so he can give you some advice about what to look for and what to do. Um, if everything seems to be okay and you wanna, and then you could chlorinate your, your well water, I'm not an expert in that either, but again, there's handouts back there that tells you step-by-step step how to do a chlorination. Um, the DNR, also their website is a great resource, or calling the DNR, they have water specialists and they, they also will give you some advice. Um, the second thing is um, nitrates. So if you test for nitrates, and I know that we have um, a lot of wells that, that have tested positive for nitrates, or have high nitrates, and that was mentioned earlier tonight that the level is 10 parts per million or, or um, below is what the, what the cutoff should be. Uh, it's especially dangerous, of course, for children, infants especially, and pregnant women. It can cause miscarriage. It can cause uh, blue baby syndrome where babies don't get enough oxygen. So if your um, water is positive for nitrates, then um, if it's like 10 or, or higher, then you definitely um, don't like make baby formula with it. Um, don't have a, if, if women are pregnant, don't have them drinking the water. You wanna use bottled water. Um, the other thing you can do is um, get a uh, reverse osmosis water system. will filter out nitrates, but you wanna make sure that it's a reputable system and it it's really does what it's supposed to do. And uh, the Department of Safety and Professional Services, the DSPS, is the department that regulates those kinds of devices. So you can look online and or, or give them a call to find out what you know what is the best device to use. So I just wanted to um, also I left quite a few handouts back there on the table. Um, included our list of water testing labs. It costs about nineteen dollars um, to test for bacteria and about nineteen dollars to test for nitrates, and that's at the Colfax lab. Um, there's a lab in Somerset, and then there's the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene also, and a lab in um, Stevens Point. And I have some um, water sample kits that you can take. There's one from um, the State Lab of Hygiene in, in Madison, and there's one from Colfax Lab if you wanna, you wanna get a, a, a kit and test your water. Um, also again, I left information back there about uh, on the table on how to check your well cap and do a whole inspection of your well if you do have a positive test for bacteria. And then there's information on how to chlorinate. Um, I also left, um, there is a resource, there's a, a well compensation program through, through the state of Wisconsin. If, you, if your well was bad and you had to, to do a new well, dig a new well, that they, um, there is some um, 
funding, some grant money available that would help you to do that. I mean, of course, it's based on in income, but um, the website is on this sheet back there. So if you want to look, take, check that out. And um, also, um, there's a handout back there about, and this is from the DNR, but within this handout is um, a whole list of other contaminants that you might want to test for in your, in your well water, um, like arsenic and pesticides, um, lead, copper, um, even fluoride. So, questions? Yes? Testing for atrazine. This is the yes. bottom on your list here is this bottom where they just say pesticides. Do you know <coughs> how Which, we go about, person goes about that test? That would be, I think that's in here. I can tell you it's only done at the state hydrogen <coughs> lab and it's very expensive. Like okay. what's very expensive? $90? They wouldn't even tell me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, if you call the state lab So how hydrogen, do you know if you've got atrazine <laughs> problems in your water? I had heard somewhere in the 90. Ninety dollars. That's what it costs. Yeah. I thought I got yeah. that some State company. hygiene lab. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's this, this, this one. This is Madison, and the phone number's on this sheet. And if you call down there, they're really, really good about asking, answering your questions. If you have, have a, want to test for a certain thing, they'll help you to do that. If they are able to do it, they'll let you know. Yeah. So. If not, you just put them on a conference call with Dell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't have that. You know what? In statute, it says the health officer has a lot of power, but I, I don't really think I do. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Deb. I just wanted to say that um, in response to your question, we live in an area near the Richmond where they have brought water up to the country and because of some leakage from a dump site and many years ago we had our, our well tested for organophosphates and all sorts of things. Yeah, uh, and that was several hundred dollars but we felt better knowing what our results were in making a decision and off the top of my head I can't remember who, who did that, but someone collected it and tested for it. And, and if I had your number, I, think, I know I have the information yet, whether he's still doing it or not. Sounds um, good. And there's also a very good handout from our community development uh, department on water treatment options. You know, we had several folks that had E. coli in their wells in Emerald Township this past summer. Mm -hmm. Most of them got by with bottled water until they got the well chlorinated, but they also recommended one of the homeowners recommended to me that she had heard from the missionaries in Africa use these Berkeley water filters because it's good for waters in Africa. That's mm -hmm. how bad we've gotten at times. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's on your agenda too, but this is a very good handout in case you do have those issues. Mm -hmm. All right, Jody, what we do on top of the land affects our water. And Jody is an expert at Land Stewardship Project, and I asked her to come and summarize that quick so that people get more conscientious about what we do and how it affects our groundwater. Thanks. Can you get up the... I have a couple of slides. I'm feeling very humbled to all these experts, and oh, I'm yeah, not an expert. That says Jody. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. On groundwater, but I am um, a member of Land Stewardship Project, and I, it's a phenomenal organization that has done some really wonderful work on soil health and um, water health and farmers. Their land stewardship organization, they want to see more farmers on the land, not fewer. Um, so this is where, I have this great slide, but I don't really know what a lot of it means, so just bear with me. <laughs> um, so George at LSP sent me this stuff over. Um, but basically we are in, as we all know, declining soil health and water quality. Soil is, is the crux of what cleans our water. If we have dead soil, it cannot clean our water. If we have soil that, you know, it, the manure is running through it so fast because it's not full of all the microorganisms and things that it needs, it cannot clean our water. I think so often that is left out of the conversation. Soil has to be part of the conversation. Um, get that. Um, so we want to turn soils into sponges and you do that with increased organic matter. Here you can see we have 
we have no uh, no cover, so soil and the organic matter is 5% of soil, it's 58% carbon, I'm not really sure what that means. But for every 1% that we raise the organic matter, 25,000 gallons per acre of, of water is held. So if that water is held there, not only does that mean the crops don't have to be irrigated as much, but it also means that that water isn't running straight through as quickly to the aquifer. Um, if you want to... Um, here's some erosion examples. We have 100% row crops, so corn, soybeans, what we usually see around here. After a four inch rain, you can see the color of the, the runoff, the erosion. By just at putting a 10% um, perennial in with that row crop, either on buffers or right in it, um, you can see how much that was decreased. And if you have a 100% perennial, like somebody's grazing cattle, you can see that there's no runoff. What we do on the land makes a huge difference. So they have done this. Um, so LSP is based in Minnesota. So a lot of this stuff comes out of Minnesota. But they also do a lot of work in western and northern Wisconsin. And they want to do more work. So as a group, if we decide that we want to contact LSP and have them come out and do field days and classes and help us work through this stuff, they will do that. They have this thing called the... Um, Chippewa 10% project. So in, in the Chippewa River, which is in the western part of Minnesota, they had a lot of, the river was in really bad shape, and they had a lot of farmers who were growing corn right up to the edge. They, as I said, LSP wants farmers to survive, not only survive, but thrive. So they're not about taking away farmers' rights to farm. They're about teaching farmers different ways to do it and still make money. And so what they did is they, they knocked door to door and talked to farmers about, would you be willing to graze cattle on this land instead of growing corn? And their goal was to get 10% um, of that land along the Chippewa River switched over to grazing. And in the process, I have some fact sheets that um, I'll stick in the back. But um, the studies show that if you have perennials, such as grassland, on up to 20% of high-risk corn and soybean fields, it can reduce runoff and erosion by as much as 90%. Cover crops can reduce nitrogen runoff by 20% to 30%. Um, and it says through this project, they have um, so far been able to shift about 12,000 acres in the Chippewa watershed into new or enhanced continuous living cover. And this is an ongoing research project as to what's happening, but they're seeing really great improvements. Um, they have this soil builders network that they started where they do field days out on farms, conventional farms, organic farms, row crop farms, and they bring farmers out and they'll have, you know, a hundred farmers come out of all, from all over the spectrum who will come out and walk these fields and look at what each other is doing to look at cover crops and how that is helping fix the soil and the groundwater. Um, they're just having a, a, a lot of um, great... Um, success with that, and it's my dream that we get some of those happening over here. So, next one. Um, they have just recently put together this pocket guide, Soil Health, Water, and Climate Change, a pocket guide to know what you need to know. So I have about 20 of these. Um, it's They're just two pages as a chapter, lots of great information, not hard to read. So um, please pick one up, especially if you're in a leadership position. I, I beg you to read this and, and understand. I mean, if if I hadn't been as involved as I am with LSP and taking classes and learning about this stuff, I wouldn't know. You know, typical, not that there's many young farmers, but those that do, they go to, they go to college and they get a degree because they want to be the best farmer they can be. This is not what they are learning. They are learning what the large corporate egg departments or businesses want them to learn because they want them to buy their product. This, nobody's going to be buying a product if you're farming this way. So it's really important to get the word out. So I, I really would love it if you read this stuff. It's, it's wonderful. Um, this is another um, initiative they're working on, women landowners. There's a lot of women, especially older women, who are either widowed or maybe they've inherited the family farm. They don't want to farm themselves, so they're renting it. And a lot of them care about the environment. They care about their water and soil. 
and they would like to know that the farmers they're renting to do also, but they don't know how to have those conversations. So this is um, something that they're doing to help empower these women to have those conversations and work with the farmers or find farmers who are going to treat the land that they, the way they want. Farm Beginnings is a class that LSP does. That's how my husband and I got started with LSP. That's how we got started farming. Um, we, it's just a whole different way to farm. Um, and so without them, we wouldn't be farming. And we certainly wouldn't be farming the way we do now where the earth and the water is so important to us. So um, again, just a really wonderful work that they do. Um, and they, they, had, they held this class in Amory two years ago. I mean, they, they have been in this area um, doing that. Um, so they also do a lot of work, um, you know, working on legislative stuff, farm bill, um, a lot of Minnesota legislative stuff. They are not able to work on Wisconsin stuff at this point, but hopefully someday they will be. And then um, this last slide. Thank you. They do, they've been working with some counties. So in Polk County, Minnesota, farmer Dan Jennings with Chip, was working with the Chippewa 10% project. He said, why don't we increase soil organic matter by 1% countywide and make it part of conditional use permits? So Polk County language now has in draft, work with farmers and other appropriate agencies and organizations to support research, education, implementation of BMPs intended to improve the long-term health of agricultural soils. Consider implementation of regulations in this regard as necessary. So something that they've found that they can do on a local level to make, make an impact. Um, so again, things I think important to think about, LSP is a wonderful resource. I, I really encourage you to check out the website. I know it's on the sheet you got. I have, again, have these um, fact sheets and the booklets I'll set in the back. Please take them, read them. always taught me, you know, we reap what we sow more than we sow and later than we sow. And I think farmers <laughs> understand that better than anybody. And so what we do on the land affects us long term. So as a result of that, I really am thankful to the Wisconsin Farmers Union, Jerry, Jerry and Shark Crows. Uh, would you like to say a few words and your support for this? And who's going to take the short straw, huh? <laughs> no, I'll start out. First of all, I just want to say it was really great to have so many wonderful people on that water study committee, and I'm glad we can claim several of them with farmers and members. It shows that farmers and members care for the land, care for the water, and want to do whatever we can to make our water safe. Um, and when you're talking about talk to your legislators, Farmers Union has two government relations people in Madison, and they communicate with us constantly by email and see what's going on. For instance, the last deal was a big cooperative bill, and I think Rob got emails from us, didn't you, Rob? I took the email. Took our information to you, whatever you did with it, that's what you <laughs> did. But anyway, this is what's important. Like, she's, like Mary said, you have to know what's going on, you have to communicate with your legislators and let them know how you feel. Uh, even one letter, one email will make a big difference. So if you're at all interested in finding out about Farm Junior, we've got a few newsletters back here. We've got our sheet from our annual meeting, which we just had last week, saying what we accomplished this past year. And one of the things was obtaining funding so that we could send out the notices for these meetings. We've got a grant through State Farmers Union. So it's things like that that Farmers Union is doing. Last spring, we had a water meeting in Emily Town Hall. And, um, Farmers Union people from two different counties were in attendance at that one. So um, we're doing what we can. We need all the bodies to tell the legislators what we really want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm the president of Sunset County Farmers Union. I want to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to read you a mission statement that Farmers Union stands for. As Wisconsin Farmers Union is a member driven farm organization, is a committee enhancing the quality of life family farms, rural communities, all the people through the education opportunities, cooperative endeavors, and civil engagement, which I think is huge. 
um, come, come as like Nick, Nick, um, not Nick Neal. Uh, I've been pushing for a long time. That's what I'm on the Stanton Town Board, uh, Farmers Union. I've been pushing for a long time. I haven't got too far with it, but I'm right on with you. These high capacity wells. We got satellites up some stairs that run our TVs. We can take these satellites and monitor these wells. These wells, most of them what I don't know, high capacity wells. Every year the DNR wants a verbal commitment on how much water they pump through these high capacity wells. They're all human. I'm not gonna tell you. You put, it, you put monitors in these wells, they know exactly how much water these wells are using. And it's it's huge. Our town board about 15 years ago had a farmer in our township. We had a high capacity well on our county road H and T on the north and south west corner. And we had a farmer wanted to put a gravel pit in the north east corner, the north southwest corner, southeast corner of that same property. And and I wasn't against the gravel, because we need gravel. We need rock. I was against having a high capacity well hundred feet apart from the other high capacity well. And I said to him, I says, you know, I'm not the smartest ball on earth. But I says, there's only so much water downstairs, and we run that out, we're dry. And somebody says, you don't understand. We go down to the second aquifer. I says, I don't want to tell you something. I've never seen water run uphill yet. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. Um, one thing I want to all to take home tonight, and I preach this hard, is we're all about quality water. We're point fingers to everybody else. Point it to yourself. We all got to do our part. It ain't, it ain't going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of issues out there. I, I wanted to comment on your comment too, but uh, that one um, mirror runoff you said in that uh, storage room, um, probably a lot of you don't know now, that she said was a 68, you see that manure that was put in, was 69. Um, all your manure containment now is going to be in concrete. And that one was quite earth and uh, pit I'd expect. No? You're wrong on both. Yeah, really? They still can be earthen with clay line or uh, plastic or concrete. Yeah, and that was a... Concrete. No, it's a kind the one that I was talking about is a concrete under barn. But another thing, remember where your food comes from. I mean, we all got issues, but remember the food. You don't go to the grocery store and get your food. It comes from the fire. Thank you. Alright, is Jeff Smith in here somewhere? Nope, he's in here. I need to make it tonight. Alright, well I think we got the message about how important our legislators are in this conversation. So <laughs> I don't need to repeat that. There is a list of all elected officials that would have oversight. And I have to give a special thanks to Judy Ochterhoff, the county board supervisor for our district. She was the one that prompted me to get this forum going. So thank Judy. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> yep. thank, you. So, yeah, thank, thank Rob as well for getting our DNR folks here. Um, we have one more clean water forum in Dunn County in Menominee. November 27th, 7 p.m. Judicial Center, right? Right, yes. Okay. Yes. So one more of these to go. It's 9.05, sorry to keep you an extra five minutes. Oh, take uh, um, with some more thing. Uh, we've got the Red Cedar Watershed Conference oh, that's right. up uh, on March 8th uh, at the South Great Hall uh, in Menominee. Uh, full day, uh, we cover all kinds of topics. Uh, this is our seventh year that were uh, been in existence. Uh, we get a good turnout in the farming community and as well across the, the land, different resource talk to them. So it's a day to network and talk to people about what your issues are, as well as being educated on some other things. So I've got uh, brochures over here that give you the data and who the keynote speakers are for that day. And the last thing I'll mention is the county is going through their comprehensive rezoning this year they are taking public comment until december 15th so if you have any opinion about anything you've heard tonight <laughs> or otherwise you want to get this to st Croix county so they can consider that as they are reestablishing their zoning plans 
for the county. Um, there's info on the back table for that. So who to contact, there's a line, out, online there's a form you can fill out or you can email John Hilders directly at the county. Rob has something. I just want to say that I think it's great that we can all have these kind of folks come to give us information. So uh, at Kim and Virginia's request, I requested that these two and our folks be here. Uh, and I had to promise that this crowd wouldn't be up from that. <laughs> did that. I want to say I appreciate that you guys asked for opinions and information. Really nice, and that's why these kind of forums work. So, beyond that, um, by all means, reach out to my office. These guys, I think, will attest to that. That uh, if you send an email to my office, I get it and I respond. And uh, I like to know you guys do things. So, uh, past that, we're working on a few other things, and uh, hopefully, we'll move forward together. So, make sure I get notice for the week on March 8th. Let's see what we do. Okay, good. All right, thank oh, you, everyone. A lot of groups just kind of show up. They pick their lobby day and show up, um, which is fine. That's great. But it's to your advantage if you pick a day when we are in session, so we're going to be in the because we're, we're all over the board. And if you come down there and I'm not there, I don't mean give me a call. I'm not going to meet people here, but all of us drive down there and sit at the table and meet those. All right. Oh, what's that, Sharon? Oh yeah, take one home. <laughs> Thank you.